What a glorious weekend it is to celebrate Jesus Christ. We've been uh, honouring the cross this, this weekend, and uh, it's, it's a symbol of Christianity that's recognised worldwide. The cross is a symbol, it's, it's worn on necklaces, it's worn on earrings, and these days it's even worn in tattoos. But it's a symbol nonetheless of the cross of Jesus Christ, and we've certainly spent our weekend at the foot of this cross, centering our attention on Jesus and all that he has done for us. On Thursday night, we hosted a Passover dinner. How many of you were here for the Passover dinner that we had on Thursday night. We had a large crowd and we had a lamb that was cooked over a fire. We had some flatbread. We had some salad. And I thought we had mulled wine. But apparently it was spicy juice, but I had four glasses of it. It was really good. I was able to drive home afterwards. It's totally fine. But we learned that the Jews also had four glasses of wine they drank uh, during the Passover dinner, but that was Thursday night. Celebrating Jesus and recognizing him as the Passover lamb, the lamb of God who comes to shed his blood in order that we would be redeemed and we would be set apart. So Thursday, we talked about the preparation for the cross. The people of God in Egypt, you remember the story, they covered their doorposts, the lintel with blood, and that the Spirit of God passed over when he saw the blood and no destruction came to that home, but all of Egypt from the throne to the stable, every household was affected by what happened. Jesus Christ, the eternal Passover lamb. We gathered here again on Friday, and we called that the power of the cross. And the team did a spectacular job in presenting the message of the power of the cross through drama and music. We had multimedia and we had song, and it was, it was incredibly powerful. And as visitors gathered, as family gathered, I was Proud that we pointed everything back to Jesus on the cross. Firstly, we heard on Friday that in the cross we find the story of what I call a beautiful exchange. Jesus himself was punished for our rebellion. He was whipped that we might be healed. He was scorned. He was shamed. But in order that we would receive blessing forevermore. It's a, a beautiful exchange that takes place on the cross. We also learn that in the cross, the power of the cross, we find our victory. Because he overcame, we can overcome. And finally, on Friday, we looked at the power of the cross and we recognized that it rests, its power rests fully in our choice. Will we choose to allow Jesus to take our pain? Will we choose to allow for that beautiful exchange to take place? And many people came and left their burdens at the foot of the cross on Friday, honouring Jesus for what he was doing in their lives. And today, today we come to Easter Sunday. We celebrate. For as we heard in the scriptures, read this morning, Mary and Mary and some friends went to the tomb on Sunday with spices and they saw that it was already empty. As Jamie says, an angel had rolled aside the stone so they could see in and see that was an empty grave. Today, we join millions of people around the world who rise today and declare he is risen. He's risen indeed. Today, I want to speak about the joy of the cross. We've prepared for the cross on Thursday with Passover. We've identified the power of the cross on a Friday, today and Sunday. I want to speak about the joy of the cross. There's a, a little verse tucked away in a letter that was written to the Hebrew church. And the writer of this letter, he, he speaks of the champions of faith that went before us as examples of living of, in faith in Jesus Christ. And he gets to chapter 12 and he says, we must, we must endure, we must run the race well. And it's a metaphor that they often used in writing to encourage and exhort people to live life well, to do life well, and to do it with endurance. It's a, it's a metaphor about living our life to the best potential with God. And this is where we find our, our key for today, tucked in the second verse. I'll read you Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. We do this, the running well, by keeping our eyes on Jesus 
the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. There it is, right in the middle of that verse. This little phrase that kicked something, it stirred something in us as we were planning to to focus our attention on the cross, and as Jesus did, to recognize the joy that was before him. It says, because of the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Friday, we remembered and, in fact, celebrated in some ways how Jesus was crucified. He was nailed to the cross. We read the scriptures. Jesus endured beatings. He was beaten with sticks. He was whipped with a a lashing cord of leather that had 39 pieces of steel on it that would embed in his flesh, and it tore his flesh open. There was the the mocking as, as the soldiers dressed him up and laughed at him and ridiculed him. There was the pain as they nailed his limbs to the cross. But what about the suffocation as he hung? His arms outstretched, his, the weight of his body pulling him down, his, his lungs struggling to breathe, to bring oxygen into his body. Certainly, there was endurance. And then, there was the sword in his side. His blood flowed out. But I propose to you that that wasn't the suffering he endured. That wasn't the suffering that was the worst for him. Jesus, on that cross, he took upon himself the sins of the world. Peter writes about this in a letter to us, and and I'll read just a short part of it. He says, He, Jesus, personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. So the suffering that Jesus was enduring on the cross was carrying your sin and my sin. The sin of the whole world. But what made that a suffering? What made that such a a terrible thing to endure? Was that because God his Father is holy, he was separated. Jesus was separated from God his Father. Now, This is the first time in all of eternity that Jesus has been separated, disconnected from his Father. Caused him great anguish and pain. But you've got to understand something. God is never absent. So what was going on was because Jesus was carrying this burden of sin, the sin meant that he couldn't see his Father as he was used to. And it caused him agony and it caused him pain. When we're covered in sin, we can't see God. And that's what Jesus was suffering from. He was separated from his heavenly Father. But he was doing it for a reason. The verse in Hebrews continues. It says, Jesus disregarded the shame of the cross, the shame and the scorn of people, the shame of of carrying sin that separated him from God. He disregarded it all. I'm certain, although it's not written, that while Jesus hung on the cross, there were spiritual forces mocking him and laughing at him, thinking that they'd won victory as the Son of God was killed by man. He embraced that shame. He embraced that scorn. Why? For the joy set before him. For the joy... Set before Jesus, he endured the cross. Well, here's my point for today. What was that joy? What what was the joy? What would cause Jesus the man to submit himself and yield himself to the beatings and the shame and the scorning and the pain, the endurance and the suffering and death in the afternoon? What would cause that? What was the joy? That joy was you. The joy before Jesus was you. When Jesus was suffering on the cross, he was thinking about you. 
He was suffering shame and pain and sin and separation from God for you. He had you on his mind. Every single one of you. You are the joy of your Savior. I want us to see this in Scripture today. You're the joy of your Savior. So for those of you interested in reading Scripture, I found great encouragement this week from Ephesians chapter 1. And if you've got access to a Bible this week, I'd encourage you to read Ephesians chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, just Google it. It will come up. Let me just read it. Because Ephesians 1, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but Ephesians 1 for you, if you read it, is an amazing story about how much God loves you, truly, and how intent he was on finding a way to bring you back into his embrace and how much blessing you can have in Jesus. I just want to read three verses. Ephesians 1, verse 9 through to 11. Paul writes, God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is that plan. At the right time, he'll bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything on heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we've received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his good plan. Here's where we find the clue we're looking for. In this verse, Paul writes, because we're united with Christ, what he means by that is because we believe Jesus died on the cross, and because we believe he rose again on the third day, that's how we become united with Christ. Because we believe that, Paul says we have an inheritance. But the English Bible that I just read from, it's not quite an accurate translation of what the writer was saying. There's a double-layered meaning here. Yes, it is true, we have an inheritance, and, and it's referred to many times, and I'll, I'll point to that shortly. But the double layer meaning means something far more important that explains why Jesus did what he did. For what Paul actually means in his words is, we have become God's inheritance. When we believe Jesus died on the cross, we believe he rose again, we become, by our confession, the inheritance of Christ. So when Jesus went to the cross, he did it because God promised him an inheritance, and that inheritance is you. That inheritance is you. We can see this from the beginning of Scripture right through to the end of Scripture. In Deuteronomy, early in the Bible, when Moses is writing and recording the words of God, Moses writes this in Deuteronomy 4 verse 20. Remember, the Lord rescued from the iron-smelting furnace of Egypt in order to make you his very own people. And his special possession, which is what you are today. See, God called you out of a bad place into his embrace so that he could recognize and call you his special possession. It was always his plan to make us his people. In the Gospel of Mark, we read about the beginning of Jesus' life. And Jesus went into the waters beside John and John baptized Jesus in the river Jordan. Mark writes this, one day Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and John baptized him in the Jordan River. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son and you bring me great joy. So here we see in these two verses I've read for you. One, God desires to save his people and take us apart as his special possession. We're God's inheritance. We see that God says Jesus is his dearly loved son. And what does a father do? Of course, he bestows an inheritance on his son. It was very, very commonly accepted in the Jewish culture. But watch how these two concepts connect in Ephesians chapter 5. The Bible paints a picture of how we're supposed to live. Paul's writing to us, and he's, he's trying to help us understand how we are to live with Jesus. And the best way he can do that is he can speak to men and women and, and encourage them on how they're to live together as husband and wife. And this is often read at weddings. 
It's certainly quoted in marriage counseling, but let me read it to you and you can see the connection. Paul says, for husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her, that many in the church, to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she'll be holy and without fault. And here's this little thing in verse 32. This is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. Paul is explaining that the way that we are to live together with Jesus is in the same um, manner as a husband and a wife come together as one. They join together and they are together as one. We can see, therefore, that God has called us out to be his own special people. We can see that, that God says, Jesus is my son and I promise you an inheritance. I betroth you a beautiful wife. And that wife is us. The bride of Christ is his beautiful church. When Jesus was suffering under the weight of the shame of the cross, the sin of the world, your sin, he endured it with joy because he knew his father had prepared a beautiful inheritance and you are that inheritance. The joy set before Jesus was you. That's got to be good news for some of us. Surely you could smile at me to think, oh, that's nice. I'm glad I'm included in that story. But there's more than that even. There's more than that. Jesus found joy on the cross and it was you. But what I want to finish with today is to encourage you that you can find your joy in the cross. Your joy comes when you recognize the power and the promise of the cross. When you recognize the power and the promise of the cross, you find your joy. Think about a, think about a marriage picture again. The, the picture that Paul paints for us in Ephesians chapter 5, and we understand, because most of us have been to a wedding or two, that two become one, and that's God's picture for holy marriage. A man and a woman coming together as one. The Bible teaches us that we're betrothed to Jesus that we will become one with him. And that's a bit hard. Paul calls it a mystery for a reason. So let me explain it to you differently. I've been trying to think of a picture that I could help us to understand where we can find our joy in the cross. And so the easiest way I could think to describe this would be to think about a simple coin that has two sides. One coin, two sides. This is a picture of how we are one with Jesus. On one side of the coin is my weakness. Thankfully, on the other side of the coin is his strength. On one side of the coin is my rebellion and my weakness, and the other side is his grace and mercy. On one side of the coin is my emptiness, and yet on the other side of that coin is his fullness. On one side of the coin is, is my faith. And on the other side of the coin is his faithfulness. On one side of the coin is my obedience. The other side is authority. This is the joy we can find when we are one with Jesus. That in him, every weakness is met. Every pain we carry, every burden we, we come up against, every struggle we have in life, that was the point of Friday. The power found in the cross is when we yield our burdens to him and leave it all at the cross. Out of that, we can find joy. We can find a beautiful picture that God has painted for us to be in the story. Jesus, yes, endured the cross for the joy set before him, but he also wants you to know that there's joy in that cross also. Jesus died and rose again to make sure that you could share in that joy. And we're going to celebrate that shortly. If I could get the band to come and get back on stage, we're going to finish with a song. But I wanted to point to you that this is the amazing and powerful gospel message of Jesus Christ. 
It's my commitment as a minister to make sure that on Easter Sunday we present the truth and the gospel of Jesus, that he is the source of eternal life with God our Father. I want you to see the rich promises in who Jesus is. Paul writes, uh, Peter writes, sorry, in his letter, 1 Peter chapter 1, let me read this to you. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we've been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. It's pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change or decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive the salvation, which is ready to be revealed to all on the last days. Today, I want us to recognize the joy of this cross, the joy that was available and presented before Jesus, the joy that caused him to endure the cross because he's waiting for you to see through that cross his love, his grace, and his mercy for you. The joy is available for every single one of us as we acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God. You, the Bible says if you believe in your heart, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus rose from the dead, that you will be saved. So this is our joy. Our joy is found in the cross and it's our joy that leads us to overcome. To overcome struggle, to overcome challenge, to overcome separation. Our joy is how we overcome. The last scripture comes from the very two last verses of Luke's gospel, chapter 24. It says of the disciples, as it should also say of you. Why don't you stand while I read this? Because this is, this is really the climax of the story. The disciples who had seen the risen Lord himself, it says this, they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continu continually at the temple, praising God. Our joy in this cross is how we will overcome things. So what I've asked for the band to do is to lead us in a, an oldie but a goodie. That we would let go of inhibition, that we'd let go of thoughts of what's happening today or tomorrow, and that we would center our attention on Jesus, and we would worship him and glorify him, for he truly is the risen Lord. Our joy is found in the cross. Let's do it.